Hi, everyone. This is Jason Barrack of Wall Street from E Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from E Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He's an independent investor and commentator. He has a background in Austrian school economics, the school that specializes in the study of boom and bust cycles in the economy. He first discovered Bitcoin on a research trip in Argentina and started recommending it as an investment at $5 in January 2012. And I'm really embarrassed that I didn't buy any then when he did. Uh, Tur Demeester, thank you for joining me again. Hey, Jason. Good to be with you. Tur, now you're joining us from Latin America, right? That's correct. That's that's really cool. So you you've been moving around. I remember you lived in the United States afterwards, and uh, you were originally from Belgium and Brussels. You know, we just had a tragedy there today uh, on the day of recording, Tuesday, March twenty second. It's just really sad. I, I want to ask you though about the global economy. Since you've been traveling now, you've lived in Europe, you've lived in the United States, you just moved down to Latin America, and you've been traveling around there. How bad do you think the global economy really is at this point? Well, like for me. My main focus has been on the West. I think um, I think uh, emerging economies are more dynamic and more robust in, in several ways, although they do have like severe vulnerabilities that I think are have been overlooked uh, during this huge commodity boom of the past uh, couple of years. Um, but uh, yeah, in the West, I think people are severely underestimating the um, the problems, the size of the problems. Uh, I mean, I lived in it as a newsletter writer, and so I was looking at uh, the reports from central banks and interviews, and just like you just saw it happen uh, in in a more, right now I feel a bit more distant from it. But um, yeah, like when Draghi came to, uh, came to power, so to speak, um, I was pretty sure that there was going to be monetary expansion, and that's happening, of course. Uh, I think... One of the things that's very underestimated is how fragile the, the banking system really is. I mean, uh, the European banking crisis barely started. I mean, look at the charts. Look at these uh, huge banks like Deutsche Bank, Societe Generale. Uh, they've been crashing those shares, even though there wasn't a lot of talk about a banking crisis. And there they are. They're, they're printing money like, like crazy again. And um, it, it just won't last. Like people think that uh, somehow this will uh, it'll blow over and they're they're patching it up and things are right and we don't have too much inflation but this is the quiet before the storm uh, I, I see problems everywhere like even in things like the pension system uh, in countries like Belgium it just it doesn't exist they just take the tax money uh, with the left hand and then hand it right out uh, with the right hand in Holland they have supposedly pension funds but when you look at them they're underfunded uh, huge problems there. Um, the, the bond markets are just are just horrible. Like I mean, Reinhardt and Rogoff, their research is very clear. Once you go above ninety percent debt to GDP in, in government debt, you're basically screwed. You're not going to grow your way out of debt. I just saw statistics uh, on the EU saying that um, debt to GDP uh, in terms of governments, uh, government debt has crossed ninety six percent now. And uh, this is way higher than where Russia was at the time that it collapsed in 97. So it's a matter of time. And obviously there's more inertia because we're talking about the West. Like, you know, we haven't had major problems in in, in multiple decades. Um, but really, I think there is there is a crack up boom coming. And I'm talking with in Austrian terms then. I think uh, eventually this will end up in, in very high inflation in uh, bond market crashes. Um, Stock markets will be relatively a good place to be if you want to preserve capital, but you're going to have to wait a long time to get back your purchasing power. Uh, I see real estate markets uh, crashing in real terms, interest rates shooting up eventually. Uh, but that's, of course, you know, a couple years down the road right now, it's still, uh, we're, we're still, the, you know, the, the, the sea is pulling back and, uh, you know, we can probably see a tsunami at the horizon, but it, it's not here yet. Yeah, sure. The, the central bankers, whether it's Japan, certain parts of Europe and the United States, they're talking about negative interest rate policy. So they, the, you know, they still have control of manipulation of interest rates in their local economies, at least for now in the major economies uh, in the 
uh, in these major governments and major economies. And even China is in the financial repression game now. Kyle Bass just put out his newsletter in February talking about how he thinks China needs a $10 trillion in U.S. bailout to be printed and they have to mani manipulate interest rates lower. But then right. the threats then of a cashless society. We've seen those. Uh, some of those central bankers talk about it. We've seen them talk about NERP. We've seen, you know, test runs for uh, bailouts and, uh, well, obviously lots of bailouts, but I mean, test runs for bail-ins. Do you think then this is why, uh, because we've seen some, and also add to that corrections then in asset markets like stocks and things like that, is that why we're starting to see Bitcoin and gold then become top performers? People are looking for alternatives outside of the normal conventional asset markets and systems? Um, I think that's absolutely the case, although it might still be in lower quantities than what we might think. Like there's still a significant barrier for people to like move into Bitcoin. But um, I mean, go to Google Trends and look at what people where people are looking for Bitcoin and how the trend is. Uh, like very strange little countries like Ghana, South Africa, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, Nigeria, they've all seen a huge boom in Bitcoin interest in the past um in the past year, even though the price has gone nowhere in dollar terms. I mean, now it's going up, but uh, I'm talking about general interest in Bitcoin has not like spiked incredibly. But these are countries that have severe currency problems and where people have severe problems moving their money in and out. Uh, also in China, the, the, the um, uh, spreads are um, positive in China, which means that traders are willing to pay one to three percent more uh, for Bitcoins in China versus the Western prices. Uh, and I, I link that with the with unrest uh, related to people wanting to move money abroad, expats having increased problems opening bank accounts uh, in China. So absolutely, I think um, I think there's there, there's a clear correlation there. And I think but I think we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, I think there is there is real panic uh, to come right now. Everything is, you know, look at the S&P. It's. <laughs> People who invested a year ago are still fine. Um, and uh, same with the bond markets. Like who, who really is in trouble? It's, it's more in the emerging markets for the moment. Yeah, I think there's a lot of flight capital that's come into the United States from other countries into our markets. They perceive it as safer. Uh, and I think there's also been a concerted effort to manipulate U.S. markets higher to prevent them from crashing because yeah. of what happened in 2008. Uh, you know, when uh, there was blood in the streets and there was, you know, rumors of... Uh, uh, there was there was rumors of let's see here for, not force majeure but military control you know within and the ATM shutting down in 2008. I don't know exactly how true that was and how close we were to the brink, but that's what the bankers were telling you know the politicians in Congress in the United States that you know if we didn't get the tarp, if we didn't get the bailouts, there are, the ATMs were going to stop in a week. There was going to be no money to be had. The food in the grocery stores was going to shut down. Stuff like that. Now, since you live in Latin America, uh, you know obviously there's been problems with Argentina and Venezuela. Those are some of the main culprits uh, with bad governments in Latin America. Argentina has had elections recently and things are starting to improve there. You've seen the mining companies in Argentina start to be a little bit more confident with uh, with their investments in Argentina. But it, uh, are they embracing Bitcoin and uh, dig digital currencies a lot, in your opinion? Uh, we're talking about small pockets. We're talking about small pockets of people, even though like you know, go to Buenos Aires and I'm sure you can buy Bitcoin in the street. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem. Or if you want to sell Bitcoin, you can do that there too. Uh, there's online maps for you to like find money exchangers and stuff. And I expect, uh, I haven't been there recently, but I, I suspect the situation has improved because the government has basically um, admitted that how weak the peso really is. Like the official exchange rate is now more... Uh, more similar to the actual market exchange rate, uh, which is good and probably means that if you go to the bank, you can probably get a, a more fair exchange rate there. But uh, yeah, they have a long ways to go. And uh, I see Bitcoin used as a remittance tool more and more. Uh, there's um, Bitcoin exchanges that are integrating with each other and they're forming this mesh network uh, whereby, you know, I've heard uh, uh, Mexican Bitcoin exchange working together with the Chinese Bitcoin exchange, for example, allowing people to uh, send money for like three, four um, percent a charge from Mexico straight into China or straight into India. Like these are things with Western Union, you would pay like 20 percent. And then how much paperwork would you need and how long would it take with Bitcoin? You can do it in a matter of hours. So 
Yeah, I definitely think that Bitcoin is uh, is a growing market, um, is, is growing in terms of remittance. And then also expats, specifically U.S. expats. Man, if you live abroad, it's a bit of a nightmare if you want to if you want to bank. FATCA is really uh, hanging as a dark cloud above all these foreign banks because uh, they can be held liable if uh, and, and they have to comply with any uh, IRS requests for uh, more information on, on their U.S. customers. Yeah, there's a lot of savings to be had. You mentioned the difference between Western Union and the blockchain fees. And I think the blockchain fees have gone up from four cents per charge. They used to be one cent. Now they're up to four cents and people are bitching about that. But that's kind of ridiculous when you look at the differences people would pay is if you're using a normal bank wire transfer, right? It's $50 fees each way, plus a percentage, I think, of what you're sending over. And Western Union is less than a regular bank to bank transfer, wire transfer from one country to another, but they're still charging a high amount of fees compared to to Bitcoin and those. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, like this whole, it's part of the whole blockchain, uh, the, the block size debate. Um, Bitcoin fees, like should they be zero? Uh, how high should they be? I think this is a temporary issue, like Bitcoin will scale, but it's going to scale in layers and it takes some time to work on those second and third and fourth tier layers uh, on top of Bitcoin, which will be for uh, perfect for scaling small uh, or relatively small transactions, like say transactions between $5 and $1,000. I think in the long run, in the very long run, those will probably not take place on the main Bitcoin blockchain. Because uh, there, there's only capacity for five transactions per second, and uh, but those transactions are the most secure transactions on the planet. Like literally, there's no other system that is more secure than the Bitcoin network today, and so it makes sense that that will not that is not free forever, right? And we had excess capacity because Bitcoin was growing uh, rapidly, and that the five uh, sec um, five transactions per second were not filled up. But eventually, you know, enough people were gambling on uh, using the blockchain. Um, they were mixing coins. They were doing all kinds of small transactions. And of course, eventually, the 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 you know the space for free transactions became almost zero. So just to clear up any misunderstandings, there was some like um, there was some um, let's see clamoring about uh, the Bitcoin network being clogged and it being impossible to get any transactions through, that's absolutely nonsense. If you just added an appropriate transaction fee, your transaction would go through even in those uh, days of like supposed panic in, in Bitcoin. And if you had a transaction that was stuck in the blockchain because you didn't, uh, your fee wasn't high enough, uh, you could quite simply uh, send a new transaction with a little fee to unlock those bitcoins, so um, a lot of that I think is is overblown, and uh, and people are fixing it, and Bitcoin scalability will absolutely happen. So so those problems and with the hashing where it took too long for transactions to be processed on the blockchain, we've heard about those in the last X number of months. You think uh, you know those while they were prevalent for for a little while, those are going to start going away uh, in the near future? Then well, yeah, it's like I mean every. Every 10 minutes, a new block of transaction is published. Transactions is, is published, is, is uh, cleared on the Bitcoin network. And uh, that's, I think it's about 3,000, I have to I have to do my math again. I think it's like 3,000 transactions. Uh, could be a bit more, three to 6,000. And so it's like a train and it has, you know, empty seats. And if there's not a lot of people who are wanting to do transactions, you can just hop on the train for free. Uh, but eventually if enough people want to use that system, uh, you won't get on the train unless you pay a little price to, to, to sit on board. It's, it's very simple. Like it's people like overcoming we're, we're, you know, Bitcoin is meeting the real world where things just cost money. And, um, but of course, uh, there will be all kinds of trade-offs possible. If you want free transactions, by all means, open an account with a Bitcoin exchange and they will happily pay the four cents for you. Of course, it's like with Facebook, I don't pay for, um, host, hosting. I don't pay Facebook to host my content on, on their website, but there's a trade-off because, you know, there's a, a little bit less privacy. There's less uh, security that I will always have that content available to me and so on. So uh, in the future, people will absolutely be able to keep sending Bitcoins for free. It's just they will have to decide what their personal trade-off is. And if they want maximum security, which is the main main Bitcoin blockchain, 
there will be some some kind of fee involved and it will be lower than the legacy system do you think then with some of these problems that people are debating about Bitcoin, do you think it's opened the door up then for Ethereum or some of these other competing blockchain uh, coins to come in and, and steal market share or, mo or momentum from Bitcoin? Uh, yeah, I think that's happened. It's happened before, although this time it was like, I mean, really, it, it is kind of an existential debate. Like, what do we want? Like, is is the Bitcoin main chain, should it be Visa or should it be Gold? Like, you can't have both. Uh, and it's possible that the Bitcoin main chain will split up and it will be like the two visions will um, will be pursued via uh, independent blockchains. That's totally possible. Um, but uh, yeah, it has opened this uh, this avenue, uh, although Ethereum really is about smart contracts. It's about this like advanced capabilities. Uh, I think it's probably a bit early for that. Uh, to really see mass market adoption, you need the network effect for these things to really work, I think, or at least for most of them, most of those projects. Um, I don't know. I really believe in uh, price physics uh, in the sense that an asset that rises in price uh, is different, is very different uh, from an asset that drops in price. People look at it differently. They treat it differently. They, they ask different questions about it. And so right now, Ethereum is an asset that has gone up for a while, and uh, there's a whole discussion around it, which is great, and uh, there's lots of uh, fantastic ideas uh, going around. But I'm curious what will happen if the price dynamic changes and it starts dropping in price. I think we'll see a lot more concerns about scalability, for example, uh, legitimate concerns about Ethereum scalability, about uh, whether or not it's decentralized and will, whether it will stay decentralized. Uh, whether or not uh, Ethereum type transactions can also be done on the Bitcoin network using sidechains, for example. Uh, and so it remains to be seen whether Ethereum has enough of a base, uh, 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 enough of a network effect, enough of like um, um, uh, features that are above and beyond what Bitcoin has to keep to keep their momentum. Uh, that's really key, I think, because if they lose momentum, they could be very vulnerable uh, to, to decline. We've seen that happen in the past with other altcoins. Uh, so I'm actually short uh, Ethereum for the moment. I have a small short position. Uh, I think it's a bit overheated. I'm definitely looking into it. I have some concerns, but um, if I think it has promise, I will look for the price to go lower and then I will invest myself uh, but for the moment, I'm I'm tending towards being skeptical that this will be the long-term uh, contender. It will be the Pepsi to Bitcoin's uh, Coke, for example. I'm I'm a little skeptical about that so far. Yeah, I think long term, I think there's going to be a lot of innovations from the blockchain. But, you know, whether smart contracts or, or owning part ownership of a car, maybe divide ownership. So everyone owns, you know, a tiny little fraction of a car and then people don't have to directly own a car. They could just call the car when they need it and then they don't own it anymore. They could just, you know, uh, put a reservation in for the car that, oh, I'm going to use it for two hours on this day right. and two hours on another day this week and someone else owned the car the, the other days. Uh, but we, we've seen over $300 million invested into Bitcoin and blockchain technology companies. Uh, what types of companies is the money going into uh, from the private sector? From the private sector, it's been, um, well, you've seen a lot of money go into real infrastructure, uh, mining, obviously. But then, uh, although that a lot of that is self-funded because, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin mining is pretty pretty lucrative if you if you do it right. Um, but uh, yeah, infrastructure, um, companies like Digital Asset Holdings, the, the Black Masters company, uh, they raised another, I think it was 60 million. Um, there is Blockstream who raised 55 million. Uh, Chain raised um, 50 million. Uh, let's see, there's a few other ones. Um, so these, these companies are very much focused on uh, expanding the, uh, the capabilities of Bitcoin, so scaling Bitcoin and also on building bridges towards the banking system. And then also there's experiments with like, what can we do with blockchain technology within the legacy system? So all of that is, is, is what I see the most money go to for the moment, really uh, infrastructure works. And then there's a few um, cons consumer oriented companies, but the invest like, and for example, um, sorry, to the previous topic still, uh, 21 Inc, they raised $106 million. Uh, they're also infrastructure uh, focused, focused on, on building this developer 
uh, community that will really uh, expand uh, on Bitcoin, whereby the Bitcoin computer is a bit like the browser in the 90s. And I think it's no coincidence that Mark Andreessen is, is invested in 21. But uh, yeah, there's also consumer-oriented companies and some, um, some remittance-oriented companies. I think they've probably been struggling for the past year and a half because the price has gone down. So um, yeah, I, they haven't raised that much, although I think there is, there is promise there. But they have some problems because they were banking on Bitcoin transactions being uh, very cheap. Uh, at least a bunch of them were. And so they're kind of worried now that the price is going up, whether their business model is, is still viable. And I, I'm, I imagine that investors have that same worry, which is why we haven't seen that much money flow into these uh, consumer oriented companies. Now, also, central banks and Wall different Wall Street, the large big banks, have shown interest in wanting their own private blockchains. Uh, it, they seem to have an, a very interesting idea to use it. I interviewed one guest. He's not a technology expert like you are, although he did work on Silicon Valley. He doesn't understand the blockchain quite as much as you do. But what he said was he thinks you know governments want to basically eliminate central banks, swallow them up, and then have their own private blockchains to where they could control the currencies that way, and then they could issue the currencies to themselves, and they could have it would prevent you know the underground economy. They could track and tax every transaction. Uh, from from your perspective, do you think this is what the governments want and the uh, the large Wall Street banks? Why do you think then they're uh, looking at starting their own private uh, blockchains? I think every new technology somehow, somewhere is going to be used or attempt to be used for warfare. And, and this is this is what it is like, of course, I mean, blockchain is very powerful and um, people who have certain interests, they will use it and governments will try to use it also. Um, and uh, but then the question is, like, how how viable is that uh, if people have the choice between Fed coin and Bitcoin, which one will they choose uh, Fed coin, which is centrally uh, controlled, where the money supply can be increased or decreased with the click of a button, whereby, who knows, maybe it can be backdoored or it can be hacked. If it has centralized control, maybe uh, people can just double spend uh, these uh, these government issued uh, currencies and create like uh, forms of attack on, on those currencies. Who's going to want to mine those coins? Because, you know, proof of work, the mining algorithm is really what protects these this decentralized network uh, are governments going to like force companies to like start mining it are they going to use different ways to secure it like there's a lot of questions there and or, and or. i think i think it's great i think it's just i mean, I mean uh, I, i'm not really it's purposes that it's being used for but i do think it will help make bitcoin or blockchain economy sorry blockchain technology more mainstream because how bad can it be if governments use it? It's kind of like with the internet, when the government started having their own websites, when they started having uh, legislation about the, the internet, it really helped um, raise the credibility of, uh, of the whole field. So in that sense, like I'm, I'm not worried at all that there is any, you know, any sort of threat coming from the UK government or other governments who want to issue their own altcoins. But uh, I do think in the long run, it will help, it will help actually. Yeah, I mean, if there was a fair competition, if there was a fair playing field, if governments didn't try to tax maybe Bitcoin holders even more or something like that to force them into their own blockchain technology, I would be less worried. But I have a little bit more information than you in this aspect. I actually had dinner uh, about a month ago with a regulator at one of the banking regulators, and he told me he was getting presentations from Wall Street people and higher ups at his banking regulator about Bitcoin and blockchain and digital currencies and things like that. And they told him in the presentation that only only criminals use Bitcoin and that Wall Street and the large bank blockchains, you know, that they had hired the developers over, those were going to be the safe ones that people should use and trust in the future. Right. So, um, you know, if the, if that's the message and the governments then are going to start taxing then people like crazy who hold Bitcoin and try to force them, you know, back into the old uh, dinosaur money system and into the new their new private blockchain, government blockchain or large bank blockchain, then I think it's time to be worried. Well, yeah, but yeah, but then again, like the world is bigger than the U.S. alone. Like maybe the U.S. government can pull something off like that, even though like, I mean, obviously we're not in the 30s anymore. Like government have, they have a lot of means to enforce, th enforce things. But I mean, the big and feared gold confiscation of the 30s, 
Uh, I think it was Milton Friedman who uh, did some research on it and found out that only, I think it was only 25% of the people actually uh, sold their gold to the government, even though it was a criminal offense to not do so. Um, so really, like, how many people are going to, um, you know, sell their Bitcoins to the government or are going to report all their Bitcoins? And that's just talking about the U.S. Like, there will be other countries where uh, they will have a different approach. They will say, well, listen, we have had a bond crash. Our currency is 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 worthless. And um, we don't really know how to launch a new currency on our own because uh, to what will we, we peg it? The dollar is worth... Uh, is, is very volatile as well. Uh, we don't have a lot of gold. So how about you guys just pay pay your taxes in Bitcoin and uh, and we'll just legalize it and you can even get paid in Bitcoin if you want to. Uh, that's the kind of scenario I see happen in different countries. So absolutely, I see countries who will be very aggressive against Bitcoin and other countries will, be, um, will do the opposite. And the money will flow where uh, it is treated best. So that's why in the long run, I'm really not worried about, you know, Bitcoin, the network uh, being threatened by these uh, these government, um, you know, uh, actions. Yeah, so it's either the banks or governments are are colluding in some cases to, you know, try to uh, try to move the business to themselves so they can get a larger cut. I think if the governments knew they were getting a larger cut, then they wouldn't care. And the banks are the banks are worried that this will reduce their fees because the banks make so much money, like you said earlier, uh, with the remittances. You know, if you're doing a bank to bank wire transfer from one country to another, the banks make enormous fees yeah. off of that. Yeah, yeah. And also they park the money like if if it takes you a week to move money from place A to B, then for a week that money is parked somewhere and invested somewhere somehow and the banks can make money off that. Yeah, that's that's another great point. I want to ask you about the Byzantine generals dilemma. We have we have a lot of listeners to this uh, podcast. They love the Austrian school of economics. They love gold and silver. Uh, you know, some of them are older and are not as technology technologically savvy. Uh, how would you explain to Bitcoin what why they should? What would your argument be why they should maybe own one Bitcoin or two Bitcoins for speculation? Then, in addition to their gold and silver holdings, and how do you think Bitcoin then? fits in with the Austrian school of economics. If von Mises or Rothbard were alive still, what do you think they would say about Bitcoin in terms of like its viability as a currency? Right. Well, um, yeah, it depends. Like I, I usually like to ask people like straight up, like what are your biggest concerns about Bitcoin? Because that really allows me to specifically address those. Uh, and, and they come from many different places. So uh, one of the common concerns early on was like, well, is Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme? Or uh, is it, you know, is it, can it be hacked? Or, and I think in the past seven years, it's been pretty much proven that, yeah, Bitcoin, the network is an unhackable, even though there's a $6 billion bounty, uh, nobody has done it. Uh, I mean, hacking exchanges is different from hacking the network. So uh, obviously, you know, in the same sense, Mount like Gox, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we all know what happened with Mount Gox. That was not not the blockchain's fault. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and I mean, like there was wildcat banking in 19th century uh, America uh, at the time when the U.S. was on on a gold standard. And, but it doesn't mean that gold was a bad investment at the time. It just meant like you had to be careful which banker you would entrust your gold to. And it's Bitcoin is similar. It's a digital gold. It was invented seven years ago. And, uh, you know, people an industry has to develop and it has to uh, mature over time. And we will see many more bankruptcies happen because Bitcoin banks cannot be bailed out. You can't just print new Bitcoins. So why I would argue that people should hold uh, at least, you know, one percent in Bitcoin or something or at least hold one Bitcoin. It's just that, um, yeah, like the what if question, like we we've had private currencies be tried over and over and over in the past 10, 15 years. We had many, many experiments and they all failed because somehow there was an element of, of central centralization. Like you had to have the servers uh, that would register all the e-gold transactions and those were in one spot. And that's how e-gold ended. And, um, and so all these experiments failed, but the goal was very noble. Like, yes, we want an alternative. Over the past hundred years, so many things have been privatized. Like, um, uh, media has been privatized. It used to be government radio, government television all over the place. Uh, transport has been massively privatized. And, and now we have a chance to privatize money. And so what if this is it? What if we've done it? 
uh, in that case, you want to uh, you want to own a little bit of it. Um, if uh, the legacy system fails, Bitcoin is uh, you know it has its flaws absolutely, but it works entirely independent from any legacy system. That's incredible. Like there is nothing, hardly anything out there that is as independent, and it's also totally uncorrelated. Like it it doesn't. It actually has some negative correlation with uh, with gold. I think weirdly enough. Um, so why not own just a fraction? Because if you look at the potential of Bitcoin, it's, yeah, it's massive. Like if it really is the new gold, if only 1% of gold investors divest into Bitcoin, the price will go up to $3,000. So, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, like you have to be careful with the, oh, if, if this happens, then the price is gonna, is gonna go times a hundred. But, uh, I think in the case of Bitcoin, it really is true. Like, uh, you see very credible cases be made that Bitcoin is a great remittance product. Very credible case that uh, Bitcoin is fantastic for uh, e-commerce. I buy my stuff on uh, Amazon using purse.io, which allows me to buy it. You know, paying with Bitcoin allows me to pay 20% less. Uh, why is that? Because uh, purse is a market where uh, people in India and other developing countries who do work for Amazon, they get So they want cash in their hand. They sell it at a discount for Bitcoin. And I'm on the other side of that. And I buy their credit for less, which means that I can buy my stuff for 20, 30% cheaper on Amazon. Like there's the, all these uh, Bitcoin as gold 2.0. Like absolutely, you can store Bitcoin in a more secure way than you could possibly store gold. I mean, like I'm happy to have that discussion. It's absolutely possible uh, to do that across multiple jurisdictions. Um, um, I can even store it in my head. You cannot store gold in your head. So there's just there's just too many promising possibilities to not at least have a tiny bit of exposure. That would be my my argument. Yeah, I, I think that's a good argument. And you know, I wrote in my 2015 review, 2016 preview that for speculation purposes, people should own at least one Bitcoin. And you know, if they have a lot of gold and silver, that's fine. But going forward, we don't know what the rules are going to be, what governments are going to try to do with uh, either gold confiscation or windfall profits tax on gold, or you know, currency controls or things like that. So people putting all their money, having all their faith in just one metal, it's uh, in, in just one metal in just one country, it's very risky. So I think having exposure to maybe some technology in their portfolio is a good thing. And one of the most promise te promising technologies out there is the blockchain technology uh, out of, you know, whether uh, in, in addition to like 3D printing and cybersecurity and robotics and things like that. I think the blockchain, the innovation that has uh, been accomplished by Satoshi, you know, solving the Byzantine general's dilemma, I think that's a pretty amazing feat. Yeah, and keep in mind, like it's important to keep in mind that Bitcoin is the end of a very long and uh, very intense search for um, um, privacy-proof electronic cash. This is something that was already conceived at the very onset of cryptography, uh, and so people have been chasing this holy grail for 20 years. And all those ideas and all those you know uh, systems that proved to be uh, useful, they have been incorporated into Bitcoin. It's not like Satoshi came came like from heaven and, and just invented this thing. Like it, there's a very long, uh, a long landing strip, or how do you call that? Uh, uh, whatever. Like yeah, he built he from. built on other people's work. Yeah. Uh, and so like it, it is a very very mature, uh, very mature effort. It doesn't mean that it's perfect. It doesn't mean that it cannot be potentially improved upon. Uh, but for the moment, I really think as far as electronic gold, as far as electronic cash, it's by a mile the best out there. If, if Google were to switch on all its servers, all of its computers, and they would start mining Bitcoin to attack the network, it would uh, have less than 1% uh, influence on the entire network. That's how powerful the Bitcoin network is for the moment. So it's very, very hard, even by resourceful government, to uh, to attack or tamper. Yeah, I, I've I've read articles when Bitcoin first started becoming popular. I think in 2010 or 2011, you know, as the price started going over a dollar and people 
uh, people started really getting excited about it. Like Trace Meyer and yourself were two of the first people to tell me about Bitcoin. Uh, I remember Austrian school economists like Jeffrey Tucker and others writing about how uh, I'm not sure if it was Jeffrey Tucker wrote this article, but it was definitely on Mises. And they said that von Mises would call Bitcoin a token, a token type of uh, form of currency or money, but not money itself. But I mean, the 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 technology behind it, though, is just so impressive, I think, from a techno technological standpoint. I think, you know, whether it's regular corporations, whether it's Wall Street, whether it's Silicon Valley, there's a lot of very smart technology people who have had success in technology, like Mark Andreessen. Uh, you know, who who have a track record of investing in successful technology ventures who endorse the technology. Right. And then, yeah, there, there was debate. Uh, and I know a lot of Austrians are very skeptical about Bitcoin because supposedly it was violating the regression theorem, uh, which is that um, according to, I don't know, I think, I think it was Menger who said that uh, every money in the world originates uh, from um, an economic good that at one point had a different function. So like uh, 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 cattle had the function of feeding people, um, cigarettes, um, you know, they all they were goods in the market that were used to something, and then you know only later were used um, were used as money, and then Bitcoin violated that because it was money from the the outset. So if there's any of your listeners who still have that concern, I would really recommend them uh, to go to uh, the website of Konrad S. Graf. He has a, a fantastic essay about, uh, it's called The Origins of Bitcoin. And he basically shows that Bitcoin is not different from like seashells. Seashells at some point were money. And yeah, at some point they were just kind of used for ornamentation, even though there's not a lot of documentation about that. But in the same, in the same way, even early on, Bitcoins were just, a, you know, a, something that was a curiosity. It was just a... Something, something funny. It was amusing to have it on your computer and play around with it, and then eventually it became money. So it absolutely does not violate the regression theorem, I believe. Yeah, and you could put give me a link to that article, that paper, and uh, I'll put it in the info box, the text box, when this interview goes up, up for our listeners to also follow. Uh, in, in terms of in terms of the the rest of the world as you see it. Uh, do you think then that more people, as as the economies become more unstable and asset markets start to fall and currency values fluctuate and interest rates, you know, confuse people, you think that's going to make people start to question the U.S. dollar and the current uh, status quo of the global economy? Yeah, and, and I mean, it's not just the U.S. dollar, but I think what we're seeing in the big picture is really the, uh, the legacy financial system that's being questioned in, in a similar way as that the church was questioned. During the um, you know during the late Middle Ages and um, eventually the Reformation, um, because the church really provided with some significant services, provided society with significant services such as insurance, um, um, uh, paying out people when they lost their income. If you lost your husband, the, the church could take care of you. It had a very important financial function. And it, it corrupted over time, and the government took over uh, a bunch of those functions, and of course also private institutions did. Uh, and so I see some parallels there, where uh, the legacy financial system makes the mistake that it's it's um, it cannot be missed because it does all these important things, but then it does not acknowledge that those important things can now increasingly be done by uh, other players, people who are not entrenched into... Uh, the position where they get access to central banking, etc., or bailouts. So, um, yeah, I think in the big picture, that's what's happening. Legacy banking, fiat money, uh, is really fundamentally being questioned. And of course, it doesn't mean that it will die uh, all of a sudden; it will get a heart attack and die. But it does mean that it might um, diminish in importance, just like the church has become less and less relevant in society over the past few centuries. I can see something like that happen over the next few generations with the traditional banking. Yeah, the the current financial system, the the current banking system we have now, it's so corrupt. The, the it's like a it's like a black hole. It's a le leviathan. It needs so much money to just keep it going from crashing. And that's the problem with fractional reserve banking. That's the problem with debt-based fiat money. That's the problem with the reserve ratios that that are allowed due to central banking. 
and in 2008, you know, in terms of the total reserves in the system, the reason the banks were uh, the reason the banks were in so much trouble is they had lent out so much money and gambled and speculated in derivatives and mortgage products and stuff. They had less than one percent of reserves to cover all their bets. Right, right. So this is just a ridiculous system here. It's totally unstable, and yet we see the stock prices of a lot of these you know markets and companies that are still doing well. And underneath, you know, we have a lot of people who don't understand how fragile and unstable everything is underneath. And people think that this transition could be smooth, and it might not be smooth at all. Right. Yeah, I don't know if you know of Joseph Tainter. He's a he's a professor who is like famous for its an anthropologist, famous for its research into uh, why society has collapsed historically speaking. And uh, so his his famous work is the collapse of complex societies. And his theory is that when societies become too complex, eventually. Hello? The sound quality, I'm sorry, Skype went out again on us for the last minute or two. We'll, we'll have the editor, we'll have the editor uh, cut this, cut this part out. So if you could just restart again from Joseph Tainer and Collapse of Complex Societies. Sure, yeah. So, so Joseph Tainer is a professor who developed theories about why uh, societies collapsed uh, throughout history. He's an anthropologist. And uh, his theory is that you know, eventually when societies become too complex, they, um, they collapse and they become too fragile and they collapse. But uh, when you look at what he actually writes about and, and you know, you look at the facts that he's describing is that basically in, he's actually saying that when bureaucracies become too complex and when the society becomes too top heavy because the, the consuming class, the, the parasitical political class, is weighing down on the productive class too much, eventually there's a collapse. And, um, and I think we'll, we'll see that in the West too. It doesn't mean that you know, uh, cities will burn or anything. It just means like, yeah, we could have a reset. We could have a reset like in Argentina, uh, like in, 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 in Germany, like there's different ways to, to, to imagine that. Um, but yeah, absolutely, the, the, there's just, uh, like like you say, the leverage is too high. The debts are too high. It's just we cannot afford to keep living like this. Um, and uh, there will be a reset. And the cool thing today is increasingly you can live independent from geography or from political society uh, by working online, by having some assets in the cloud. Like there's all kinds of different uh, gradations to which you can have exposure to uh, to the cloud, either by being active online or or, or uh, like investing in Bitcoin or investing in foreign assets. Um, and I think that's really exciting. And I, I don't think that we will um, see like another world war happen right away uh, because of this mobility, because governments know that when they really, when they really mess up, people will just move away or they'll stop working or they'll see through what's happening. Um, I do see some like problems increasing. I think it, things are gonna get worse before the private cycle starts again. But in the long run, I'm, I'm optimistic. I think this is just the most incredible time to be alive. Yeah, I think in the short term, you know, governments are going to go for more control. They're going to implement more taxes. I think the middle class in the U.S. tour, and you, you lived in the U.S. for a little bit, so maybe you can comment as someone who wasn't originally an American but saw American culture and maybe had to deal with living in the U.S. But I, I think the American middle class is being intentionally destroyed by grinded between inflation and taxes. So if you're a small business owner or an entrepreneur in the U.S., unless you're a technology guy, things are really hard for you. You have regulations, you have new taxes coming on every single year and so many different things. Right. And then your bills are going up. Uh, they're lying about how much inflation you really have. And people know this, you know, when they pay the bills, unless like they're a Wall Street hedge fund manager or, or they're, uh, you know, making a lot of money on Silicon Valley. And, you know, one of our listeners, he put a comment about this and he's like, why do you talk about gold and things like this on your channel so much? He was like, as long as the stock market's going up, as, as long as my stocks pay dividends and those are going to do well, and my real estate values are high, you know, I don't care. And I think, unfortunately, that's the attitude a lot of these regular conventional business people have who were taught in business schools, that as long as my stock account is not dropping like a rock, as long as my real estate, my, uh, we don't have a real estate market crash like 2008, none of this matters. It, it doesn't matter. And I think that's what allows the people in power, the status quo, to continue to get away with, you know, the theft, the parasite, the rent-seeking stuff that you talked about. 
in the interview that could collapse society is that type of attitude. You know, if you're getting your stocks in your dividend account, you probably don't understand that 10 years ago, those dollars or yen or whatever currency you're getting in your dividend account, they could buy you a lot more than they can right now. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, I think it's hard. It's hard to see through what's uh, what's happening because uh, a lot of, you know, m money printing often just it does cause inflation, but it usually is like three, four five years down the road. So it's very hard to connect uh, cause and effect there. Um, but um, I do think that owning a business in general and being an entrepreneur in general is um, is a very good way to to practice and to build resiliency skills. Um, you see that in Latin America, you see that in Argentina, almost everyone is an entrepreneur of sorts because, you know, there's no handouts, there's no, uh, there's no bailout for the people. And so, uh, it, you know, if you are a, a business person, it doesn't matter in which, which sector, if you basically learn to like not rely on government too much to, to give you what you need for your daily expenses, then uh, I think you're Hello, Chur. The uh, Skype Skype is stopping you again, so we'll have to pick up again about what you're saying about entrepreneurship in Latin America. We'll have to have the uh, editor pick that up again. Sure. Oh, uh, yeah, I was saying because you were saying that um, uh, you know small business owners they um, they often don't see the big picture, and uh, that can be you know maybe concerning. And but my perspective on that is that yeah, it is helpful to look at the big picture. But a lot of business people they just you know they. <laughs> Things are tough. They're busy. You really have to work. <laughs> you have to work hard to um, to to make it. Uh, but I think that even just being an entrepreneur or uh, or working in the free market, it really builds resiliency skills that will come in very handy when when you can rely less on government handouts, uh, on on social security, all those kind of things, on on uh, insurance payouts, those kind of things. So uh, in that sense, I, I really admire people who, who, who do that. And I think that they're building the right skills. They will definitely uh, do well uh, in, in the years ahead by just being aware of what the market is and what the market wants. And there will always be demand for services and products. It's just things will probably shift. And then, you know, entrepreneurs can be flexible and they can shift too. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And people in the U.S. used to be like that. I would say prior to FDR taking over and starting to really ramp up the amount of social programs and make work projects and other handouts on the government dole, Americans used to refuse to take that and they used to want to be very uh, independent and entre more entrepreneurial. We still have a certain amount of entrepreneurs here in the United States, but you know, for a number of decades, that culture was due to cultural Marxism and other stuff in the mainstream media and government schools. That stuff was bred out of us. But I think, you know, unfortunately, as the economy gets worse in the U.S., I think people are going to have to be more resilient. They're going to have to add these skills that people in other countries have been forced to have, you know, for basically their whole life. Americans are going to have to readapt. They're going to have to add more skills. They're going to have to figure out ways to supplement their income because, you know, their paycheck is not growing with the real inflation rate going forward uh, in most cases. So they're going to have to find new ways to add additional income on the side. Right. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I, I do think it's, it's you know, it's, it's a consolation to know or to, uh, you know, consider that um, if you're active in the market, I think you are on the side that will win in the long run. Because I think we're we are at or very close to peak government. Um, I think um, once inflation starts to kick in, it'll be harder for governments to raise more taxes, to issue more debt, and uh, this might be peak government of all time. This might be the biggest size that governments will get in history, because it's the peak of you know we 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 have a globalized fiat system. Like how much more globalized can you get? And then what happens when that fails? Like there's nowhere to go. We'll have private money, which means a severe, uh, make it severely harder for government to uh, raise taxes or to just issue new debt or to go to war, right? How, do you, how are you going to fund a war if you can't print money? Exactly. You can't run a welfare warfare state and keep growing the government without a central bank and then without, you know, basically a, a debt based fiat money. Right. Well, actually, you could do it with regular fiat money with the greenback, but the bankers get a larger cut with the debt based fiat and fractional reserve banking and things like that. Right. Agreed. 
Well, I just want to thank you again for your time, Tor. Uh, if our listeners want to read your articles on Bitcoin and Austrian School Economics, uh, how can they find you on the internet? I recommend them just go, uh, just search my name and then my Twitter page will show up. I'm like, I'm there every day. People can just follow what I'm about. Uh, and usually if I have articles, I publish them there. Uh, there's a link to uh, a report that we brought out as well on, on the, the main page, the main, my Twitter profile page. So Tur, T-U-U-R, and then De Meester, D-E-M from Madrid, double E-S-T-E-R. Very good. Well, I just want to thank you again for your time, and I enjoy our discussions when I have you on, and I'll have you back on again in the near future. Awesome. Look forward to it.